Welcome to the Why God Why podcast. My name is Peter Englert. We exist to respond to the questions that you don't feel comfortable asking in church. We are part of the fantastic Lumavaz network. I am here with our flexible, awesome producer, Nathan Yoder, and also this fantastic co-host, Alyssa Matz. What's up, Alyssa? I'm back again. You can't get rid of me. <laughs> you know, what What listeners don't know is our producer does Nate Cuts, and I can like hear you say, yo, it's your girl, Alyssa, oh, from no. another video. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> we we try to have fun um, because today's question, we're with one of the great friends of this episode or of this podcast, Becky Harling. She's an author and then the podcaster of the Connected Mom podcast. But the question she's asking, why do I feel so lonely in my relationships? Alyssa, before you throw it to Becky, do you have any thoughts? Or I do have a lot of thoughts on this, actually. So this past summer, I ran a summer group um, and we did the book Find Your People by Jenny Allen. And that's all about finding your community and connecting with others. And it was the biggest group. I mean, not to brag, but so many people signed up. And I don't think it was because I was leading. It was because of the topic, because so many people are lonely in this world. And so many people are looking for community. It, there was over 30 women who signed up to mm-hmm. to read the book and go through this study together. And it ended up being amazing for them. And it was great. But I just... I know that this topic is important, and I know that there are so many people who are struggling with loneliness in our world. Mm. Man, what a segue. (laughs) Segways are, you know, there you go. So, Becky, since you're going to be talking about loneliness, since last year, why don't you just uh, update us and tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so since last year, I have um, slowed down my international travel. My husband, Steve, is still doing quite a bit of international travel. However, I just felt like the Lord really wanted me to focus a little bit more on writing. And so I um, presently am under five book contracts, which means I do have to sit down (laughs) and actually write. So I'm working on those. Um, I just launched the Connected Mom podcast podcast, which has been an absolute blast. It's so much fun. I have an amazing co-host who I think is the brains behind the operation, you know, because she can do, she can co-host with me, but she can also do all the technological things that I can't do. So that's been really fun. Um, trying to think of what else I'm doing a lot of speaking. So I'm traveling around the U S doing speaking and that's been fun hanging out with grandkids. I mean, it's just all fun, Pete. I love it. Well, let, let's just dive right in because who decides to write a book on loneliness? Was there a story, <laughs> you know, was was it something that was repeated? Help us with the genesis of how you've started to really refocus on loneliness. Yeah, I love that because I, I am in the process of writing a book on loneliness that will come out in 2024. But I remember a pivotal moment where Steve and I were in the crazy of traveling internationally. You know, we did between 2016 and 2020, I think we did 65 countries. And I wrote a lot during that time. And I just remember getting back on the plane with him after we had been to a whole bunch of countries. We had seen a whole bunch of people. We had spoken together and individually and done a bunch of counseling. And I got on that plane and I said, you know what? I'm lonely. And he looked at me like I was from Mars. He's like, well, there's a whole plane here for you. Go talk to them. I'm putting in my headphones and going to sleep. (laughs) But, you know, I realized what I was lonely for was the deeper connection. Mm. I had felt every morning really rushed in my quiet time with God because, you know, I was sharing a hotel room with Steve. I didn't want to wake him up. I, so I would grab a few minutes with the Lord, go meet the next group of people, speak, counsel, all that kind of stuff. But they weren't my people, as Jenny Allen would say, you know, and I missed the deeper connections of my closest friends, you know, the ones that I can cry with and ugly cry with. And it's okay because they know me, you know, and they don't know me just as Becky Harling, author, speaker, or Becky Harling, you know, wife of Steve. They know me for Becky, for Mm. who she is. And that's what I was missing. Wow. So all of that led me to start researching this whole topic of loneliness. And so you're talking about your own 
loneliness that you discovered. How did you discover that loneliness was an issue that extended beyond yourself and beyond you feeling lonely? So I did a little research because I thought, well, maybe this is just me, you know, and the research is actually quite staggering. Um, one of my friends, Glenn Packiam, who wrote the book, The Resilient Pastor, talks about how the pandemic, the recent pandemic, didn't create problems for us, but it revealed the problems that were already in the church. So it was apocalyptic in that regard because it really revealed what was going on and and so some of the statistics I discovered is that 36%, these are according to Harvard, 36% of all Americans are feeling lonely, 61% of young adults, so like later teens, 20-somethings, are feeling seriously lonely every day. 51% of mothers with young children are feeling seriously lonely every day. And this one was the most staggering to me. This did not come out of Harvard, but came out of some, uh, I think out of the Barna group, one in every five practicing Christians, so in other words, Christians who are in church or maybe attending a small group, feel seriously lonely every day. That's incredible. And so loneliness has be been called now the new pandemic. Mm. You know, I, I'm going to throw... Becky, we're we're tight friends, so if I go in a weird direction, you'll either correct it or you'll just I'm run with cool. it. So, you know, I was thinking about this topic and I was like, you know, has there been more seasons of loneliness that I've had, or does loneliness just look different? And so like at first I was like, well, in my twenties it was really lonely, but that's actually when I had some of the best friends and I don't think I really saw what I had. But now I, I think that I'm in a season and stage as, as a married person with two kids. Like the loneliness that I feel is I feel like I, if I don't initiate it, it won't happen. And so like the work that it takes to, you know, shoot hoops with someone, the works that it takes to schedule something, and so on one hand, I'm like, you know, I have like one really good friend that like will text me and like, hey, you want to do something or get together. But like I look at my other friends and it's like I want to give them the grace that they're different than me, that they're in a similar stage of life. But I think even where my loneliness comes from is it's like it it gets really tiring being the one that always invites that is aware of people. So I don't know, like, is that because I know there's other people that it's like, I just won't do it. And I feel lonely that way. I don't have to feel it. But I do feel like there's people even like me that they'd be like, Oh, Pete's not lonely. And it's like, well, you know, we're in this stage that I can accept the difficulties of that. But also, it doesn't feel like people are necessarily reach. I don't know. Does that make sense? It, it all makes sense. And I feel like you covered a lot of topics in that short piece. For starters, I think a lot of single people feel lonely and think when I get married, I'm not going to feel lonely anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's one topic. We could do a whole podcast on that because honestly, that's not true, you know, because I know a lot of people who are married who still feel lonely, right? And so marriage isn't the answer to all of that. I think the second issue you brought up is needing to initiate. And I I think some of us are better initiator than others. Um, I mean, I'm kind of similar to you, Pete, in that I'm extroverted. And so I do initiate a lot, you know? And so I can feel lonely if I feel like, okay, they're never initiating. But then I have to realize, okay, in answer to my own loneliness, I need to initiate because mm. maybe they're more introverted than I am, but I want this connection because it's valuable to me. And I, I think something else that you didn't really bring out, but that kind of goes with what you're saying is I think one of the key inhibitors to deep connection in our culture right now is busyness. And certainly that has been true for me, you know, um, 
there have been times where the perception of my friends is, well, Becky's always busy. You know, she's always hopping on the next plane. And I'm trying so hard now to undo that because I think, you know, Dallas Willard said that busyness is one of the chief problems to our spiritual walk. And mm. it, it really is because then we don't have time for connections. We don't have time to really deeply connect with God every day or each other, you know? And so I, I think we have to analyze where we are with the whole busyness thing and think, how can I create schedule, uh, create space in my schedule where I can still feel really connected to my family, which is a huge value of mine, but I can still make time for my friends. And what does that look like? Mm. You know, I think those are important questions to ask. Mm -hmm. I resonate with that, especially with the the busyness piece. The past few years of my life um, have just been so busy. And I do tend to fall on the introverted side. I do need my recharge time by myself. So I often sure. use that as maybe an excuse to not initiate. Um, I feel like I'm a little bit different than you guys where I'm not always the one initiating. I, I'm usually the one who doesn't initiate. Um, but it's just yeah. interesting to me to hear um, extroverts, or people who are outgoing, people who live busy lives like like you and Peter, um, to say that you feel lonely. Um, why do you think it is that some of the most connected people or the people with the most other people around them often feel lonely in their relationships? Mm. Well, I, I I love that question, Alyssa. So uh, there was a British psychologist, and I have her name somewhere, not in front of me. We can put it in the show notes. And she was talking about how many friends do you actually need, right? And she was saying that the human brain can't handle more than 150 connections, and that most of us whether we're introverted or extroverted, can only handle five really close relationships. And so, mm -hmm. so that's huge. So those of us that are extroverted or that have maybe a more public life, um, it may look like we have tons of connections, right? So we have, you know, you have Facebook, and we need to get into social media a little bit in this conversation too. But, you know, you, you have like maybe 5,000 friends on social media. Well, those aren't really your friends. Those are people that are following you. They're maybe readers or people that follow you on your podcast or your speaking things, but they're not your truest connection. And God has designed us for intimate connection because we grow best spiritually in community. You know, we were never meant to just come to Christ for salvation and then it's, oh, me and Jesus for the rest of my life. It doesn't work like that, right? It's you and Jesus plus your community and your deepest connections are the people who will pray for you when you're walking through really difficult circumstances. They're the people who understand you when maybe you're having a problem with one of your kids. They're the people who really get your heart and your vision and your dreams, you know, and, and those people we need to really honor with our time. Hey, you went there. So social media, let's go. Okay, Jump right let's in. go. <laughs> so, okay, I read an interesting statistic, right? The people that spend the most time on social media, I think the survey said if people are spending like 70% of their time, now maybe nobody does that, I don't know, but the people who spend mo a lot of time on social media every day, who, you know, maybe they get home from work, they're bored. Uh, boredom is the biggest reason why people go to social media, I'm convinced. So they're scrolling, right? Their mind may be somewhere completely different, but they're scrolling Instagram and Facebook and, you know, Snapchat and TikTok, right? But those are the loneliness people. Because here's the thing about social media. Those aren't real relationships. I mean, they, they have served a purpose in that I can stay connected with people who live all over the country. And some of them really are good friends of mine, you know, but then there's the masses who maybe they know my name or I know their name, but we're not really close. They're not who I would call if there was an emergency in the middle of the night, right? And, you know, I was thinking um, about this whole social media thing and, and I have to throw in a story. So 
When I was a little girl, I would spend a week with my grandmother in New York City every summer. Um, I, she lived in Brooklyn and, um, she always said that all of her neighbors were in the mafia and I never figured <laughs> out if that was really true or not. She was Swedish, but, um, so I would go in there and we, we would go to, I would go to the VBS at her church, which I loved. And then we'd come home and my grandmother would always lay down for 45 minutes in the afternoon and just kind of conk out. I can still hear her snoring. You know, she would sleep maybe for 45 minutes or an hour. But at 2.30, she would get up, she would put the coffee pot on and Aunt Isabel would come over. Now, to this day, I have no idea the relationship with Aunt Isabel. None of my siblings know who she was. She was just my grandmother's good friend. But every day at three o'clock, they would have coffee and coffee cake. And they would spend between three o'clock and five o'clock every day together, you know, and they would watch soap operas. Now, that's not perhaps the best way to connect. <laughs> but, you know, they were together in, in physical personhood. And I think in our culture now, we have social media, we're busy, we take people out to coffee, you know, we're not necessarily inviting them in our homes like that. You know, I don't, I don't think my grandmother felt lonely because Aunt Isabel was always there. Hmm. You brought up an interesting point about like proximity. So we can have all of these social media friends and maybe you follow people from different states, different countries even. Um, but having people who are actually close to you, like your Aunt Isabel and your grandma, she could physically yes. come over every day. That means that she must have lived within a close proximity to your grandmother, right? Right. And, you know, culture has changed since that time. A lot of us move. I mean, my grandmother came over on the boat from Sweden. She lived in Brooklyn, got married in Brooklyn, had her kids in Brooklyn, lived there until she died. The same house, right? We don't do it like that anymore. But I think proximity is huge. Mm -hmm. You know, we need people in our communities. Mm -hmm. So... <clears throat> Becky, because you and me are extroverted, I actually want to kind of key in on introversion because I think that that's kind of important. So, mm -hmm. you know, I guess, Alyssa, I want to ask you this directly and then Becky can respond to you. But, you know, I explained what loneliness and I think Becky and I resonated. Not every extrovert's the same, surprisingly. But, you know, what does loneliness look like for you individually as an introvert, and maybe if you were to talk with your introvert friends, you know, because it just looks different. And so maybe help our listeners understand that. And then Becky, you could probably respond to what Alyssa says. Wow. Okay. So disclaimer, I am an introvert, but every time I take the test, it's always close to 50-50. Okay. So, but I personally feel like I lean more towards the introvert side. Um, I'm also bringing up the Enneagram, Enneagram 9. So sometimes I can be low energy. Um, so for me, that's the biggest reason that I feel lonely sometimes is I just don't have the mental or physical capacity to um, reach out or to feel like I have to um, be with someone or entertain someone or have a conversation with someone. Um, as an introvert, it just takes a little bit extra effort sometimes, and mm -hmm. it just seems like a bigger hill to get over. And it, I know that after I hang out with someone or connect with someone, I'm going to probably be more tired afterwards. Um, I know extroverts, when they hang out with people, they get they get energized and they're very excited afterwards. They're like, that was great. Um, but for someone like me, sometimes it can be draining, depending on who the person is, Um it can be draining to hang out with someone. And so sometimes it's just like, I don't want to put in the effort to, to make connections with others because it's just exhausting. Um, but then, mm -hmm. then I'm sitting there and I'm lonely and I'm like, Oh, I wish I wasn't lonely. Being lonely is also exhausting. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like a pick your battle, um, choose your poison, <laughs> uh, <laughs> kind of thing for an introvert, at least for me, I can't speak for all introverts, but, um, for someone who needs to recharge, um, investing in relationships can just be tiring. Mm. Well, and I think um, needing to recharge can be a good thing. I mean, even as an extrovert, I need to recharge, you know, 
And I, I need that time of quiet. I need time alone with the Lord and all of that. But I think for introverts, uh, it's important to find or to cultivate, maybe that's a better word, three to four really close friends. You know, maybe you don't have the headspace to be a friend to everybody and you shouldn't, you know, because your life is full with other things. You're getting your master's, you're doing this, that, and the other thing, right? You probably have a job and then you're helping Pete on the podcast. But if you had like two or three friends even that you knew, okay, if I have a problem in the middle of the night, I can text these friends and they're going to pray for me and I'm going to be real with them. I'm going to be vulnerable with them because they're not going to judge me, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so I think like to be, to have those close connections does not mean that you have to get together all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's interesting because two of my closest friends, Jill and Judy, <clears throat> Jill lives in California, you know? So for a while we lived near each other, but we have a deeply rooted relationship that goes back 20 years. Judy and I lived together when, or lived near each other when we were in Rochester. That's where I met her. And we started praying for each other's kids. She went all over the place. We went all over the place. And then maybe 15 years ago, we all moved back. We moved to Colorado, you know, and, but the, the strength of that friendship is that it goes back 30 years, you know? So no matter where we are, I know Judy will be on her knees if I need her to be. And we pray together. We cry together. We pray over each other's grandkids, you know? So it's, it's the, think of it as, I, I think thinking of it as the long haul, not, mm. oh, I got to meet a million people today. I, that can feel overwhelming to anybody, you know, just who are the people you feel most drawn to, mm -hmm. you know, and then cultivate those relationships. No, I, I love that. And something that I want to kind of key in about the long haul, because, you know, I meet people that w they'll, they'll articulate to me, I want deep relationships. And uh, this might be very untactful to say it, but the process of kind of getting there, like I meet some introverts that are like, I hate small talk. And it's like, well, unfortunately, like <laughs> small talk is what leads to deep relationships. So, you know, as you're writing, as you're researching, like what, what's like a realistic process to getting the two to four people in your life? Cause I, I think also too, like for someone like me, the fact that I have like four really good friends is really important. But I also, I, I feel what I feel. And so it's trying to process through that. I think sometimes we sabotage ourselves because comparison or yep. just we're looking at everyone else. So, you know, I guess, so number one, the process, but then also just having a good realistic view of what healthy friendship looks like and kind of being okay where you're at. Yeah, I, I love that, Pete, because I think... Um, how do you get there first? I think it's really good to have self-management meetings, you know, <laughs> where you're just by yourself and you ask yourself a few probing questions like, how am I as a listener? Because if you can't listen to people, you're not going to have a lot of close friends, right? So I've been with people who are actually they're not extroverts at all. They would call themselves introverts. And I'm not picking on introverts because I've also been with these kind of people who are extroverts. But both types of people monopolize the conversation, right? Mm. They never learned how to ask questions. And I, I think if you are with people and you're never asking them a question, you're, you're not going to have good friends, you know? So when I'm going to meet somebody or if I'm having somebody into my home for coffee, I try to think back 
on when was I with them last and what was happening in their life. Mm. And then I'm intentional about asking them about that because I really want to know, right? I want to know them. So, you know, that's the first thing. And then you touched on something else. I mean, something we have to analyze in ourselves is, are we critical? Are we perceived by other people as being judgmental and critical? Because if you're out for coffee with a friend and you, in the course of a conversation, tear down or criticize five other people that you both know, the person you're with is going to feel nervous being with you, right? Because mm -hmm. they're going to think, oh man, I wonder what they say about me when I'm not here, you know? And so, you know, have a self-management meeting and ask yourself a few good questions. How do I come across? How well do I listen? Am I perceived as critical or positive? Do I put the effort into encouraging other people? That's huge in friendship. Everybody out there needs encouragement. So encouraging people is pretty simple. You just have to be intentional, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's really good. Um, Self-examination is hard, <laughs> but it's yeah. important, and especially if you don't want to be lonely. So let's say somebody identifies themselves and they say, I'm lonely um, and I want to fix it. Where would you start with that person? So <clears throat> I would start with prayer because everything in my life starts there. To, for me, that's foundational. So I would ask the Lord first and foremost, like, Lord, I feel really lonely. Help me to understand where that's coming from and what to do about it to fix it. And would you bring some close friends into my life? So I would start with prayer. <clears throat> and then I, I like to analyze circles of relationships, you know? Mm. So you might draw a circle and the center circle is God, right? How's your relationship with God? Because he's our deepest connection, right? And so you need to be spending time with him. And then maybe the next circle out is your family. What are the relationships in your family like? Are they life-giving for you? Are they draining? What can you do about changing any of that? And then the next circle out might actually be your neighbors. You know, mm. I think... We need to return to the concept of neighboring. You know, mm. back 100 years ago, people knew their neighbors. Now we're in and out of our garages so fast. We're on to the next appointment and we may not know our neighbors. And if we're lonely, they're lonely, right? Mm. So write down like all, like draw a picture of your house and then all the surrounding houses and figure out what the names of those people are. You know, maybe host a block party, I don't know, or have people over for dessert or something. You know, I, I think another circle of relationships is if you have kids, analyze the sports teams and who are the parents on those sports teams? Who do you resonate with? And first and foremost, after God, probably should be the church. So who at church are you friends with? Who are you drawn to? What are you doing to cultivate that? You know, I, I think, uh, the church is meant to be the answer to our loneliness. We are, we come to Christ, we're born again, and we're born into a sense of belonging. And so, you know, Psalm 68, six says that he sets the lonely in families and that's supposed to happen in church. So if it's not, you might need to figure out why. You know, I want to talk about that a little bit because, I mean, we're talking to listeners that could be de-churched or unchurched or kind of struggling. And, you know, my title at Browncroft used to be belong director. And I got that uh -huh. changed because I I felt this pressure. And maybe this is my Enneagram too, that like I had to be everybody's friend and help yeah. them belong. And, you know, I think I love when my wife talks about contribution I want to make sure I'm bringing the right contribution to help someone as a pastor. But with mm -hmm. church, like there's this odd tension of like going to the church leadership, whether you fill out an interest form saying, hey, I'm looking for a small group. I'm looking for a mentor. Help me out versus like the other side of that, which is like you've sat next to somebody or you've talked to somebody and you start having coffee with them. And... Like, I, I think 
from your vantage point, like you're talking to someone that's trying to navigate church. There's people that get frustrated because they can't get put in the perfect small group. And, you know, we have two wonderful leaders that do that here at Browncroft. And, you know, we do the best with what we have that's available. But then there's this other side that I don't feel like, like my dream for a church is the coffees, the hangouts, like the golfing, the the tea parties, the, um, you know, the yoga, if I'm allowed to say yoga, maybe they'll edit that out. But like the events that happen that have nothing to do with the church, like it's just people living in, I don't know, you've, you've worked as a pastor. I mean, how do you manage that? Because I think that the, how do you help people's expectations of, hey, we're going to help you, but man, you can do this a lot faster. I don't know. Take it away. I, I love that question because you can't go to your pastor and say, hey, would you find me a mentor? That's a terrible idea. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we actually, when I was directing women's ministries at Browncroft and helping to oversee our small group ministry, you know, we did this program. We thought, you know, this is a great idea. We're going to match people up for mentoring. It was a bust. It doesn't work that way. You know, if you're looking for a mentor, you look around you and look for somebody's life that you admire, and then you offer to take them to coffee and you ask them questions. And then maybe you offer to take them to coffee again and you ask them questions, you know, because the church can't find a mentor for you because you got to find somebody that you resonate with, right? And then same kind of concept with friendships. You can provide vehicles, which are small groups, but it's really up to the individual to figure out who they resonate with. You know, it's always entertaining to me a little bit when people come to churches and they say, well, I I don't feel connected. I, I get that, but why? Why don't you feel connected? You know, because we can't make those connections for you. You have to make some of those connections. The church can't do it for you. So if you don't find your people at one church, then go find a different church where maybe you will resonate more. But find a church where you resonate and then invest in that, you know, volunteer, volunteering is a great way to make friends, you know, or it's interesting because I am, um, <clears throat> I am at a church right now. That's uh, one of the new life eight congregations and I love it. It's new life East. So a big new life concept is table groups. And so just inviting people into your home to have a meal. And, and it's amazing when you do that, you know, rather than just taking people out for meals, invite them in, invite them in for coffee, invite them in for a meal, um, because the relationship goes a little deeper then. Mm. So that's what I would say. Mm. Staying on this, this topic of, of church and loneliness, what do you think the church has done well in terms of helping those who are lonely? And what do you think the church could do better in terms of helping those who are lonely? Yeah, I think the church uh, typically has done a good job. I, I'm thinking back on my mother-in-law's funeral. Um, my mother-in-law died in 2020, right before the pandemic. And she and my father-in-law had attended the church up the street from them for the last 20 years. You know, it was, it's a smaller church, like maybe 200. Anyway, everybody was there for her funeral, right? Because, you know, they all brought like food for after the funeral because they had, you know, been a part of that congregation for so long. And, and I think that most churches really want that, you know, and, and I think the whole idea of small groups, table groups, whatever you call them, discipleship groups, um, it, it's an idea to scale things down so that not everything is about Sunday morning. You know, Sunday morning is great, but we, we want to create spaces where people can really connect and, and find their people. So I, I think overall the church has done that pretty well. I think in the last 20 years, maybe 25 years, it became more platform centric 
And so everything was about Sunday morning. And I think we lost something there because, you know, Steve and I joke with each other because he preaches, I go around and speak, you know, and we, we, we keep each other humble because we remind each other that very few people, their life is completely changed by a good sermon. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, and, and bear in mind what I do. So I'm not picking on anybody else, you know, and I've heard some great sermons, obviously, but people's life lives are most likely changed when they're living life on life with each other. Mm. You know, the moments where there's a death in the family and the church comes alongside or the moments where there's an adoption and the church comes alongside and helps to raise money for that. The moments where you're with a friend and you're taking a walk and you're just praying together. The moments where you gather to pray over your kids. I, I remember at Browncroft when we first got there, uh, it was quite a bit smaller and, um, we, we were with a group of people, we were all kind of raising kids together. And, you know, your in-laws were part of that. And we were, we all knew we had each other's backs, you know? And so we, we prayed for our kids together and, you know, for JJ's friends, it was, you know, the cows and the rotors and we prayed for each other's boys because we wanted them, you know, and that, that's where community happens in those smaller settings. So I love that. And let's get super philosophical here. What, <laughs> what, what's unique about Jesus, Christianity and the Bible of how it responds to loneliness? I, I think we've hinted at it, but I wonder from your perspective, you know, just what's unique of how Christianity heal or, uh, uh, well, heals, that's a Freudian slip because it's true, but heals and kind of uh, engages loneliness that's different from the world. I I think Jesus took time to see the individual and he wasn't so wrapped up in the crowd. He wasn't so wrapped up in success. In, in fact, he's so different than every other leader because it it's almost he he's on a downward spiral to the cross right yeah that's not really climactic you know it's it's climactic in that he it, it's backwards from the way we would think it we would think oh he's going to reach the climax you know when he feeds the 5000 mm. you know and it's the crowd that's so important but not in Jesus economy in Jesus economy it's being with the 12, being with the three, James, John, and Peter, you know, pouring out his heart in the garden and eventually going to the cross. You know, he, he's the only leader, if you will, that the only blood he ever shed was his own. And I, I think that, that just get, asking God to give us the heart of Jesus so that we're compassionate for other people is a big part of the healing of our loneliness. Mm. Mm, that's good. Coming from the perspective of someone who maybe doesn't feel lonely, um, what are some ways that they can be on the lookout for or um, be a help to um, maybe other people in the church or other people in the world that they see that may be experiencing loneliness? Yeah, I love that. <laughs> I think that <clears throat> a lot of times... There are people who are not lonely and, um, and a lot of times those people are extroverts. Uh, I, I think of, you know, my son and his wife, JJ and Shana and, um, my daughter, Bethany and Chris, and what they did a couple of years ago is they started hosting these big table dinners and, and they would invite some of their Christian friends, some of their non-Christian friends. I mean, they would just be so random in the guest list and people would come and JJ loves to cook. So he would make a whole ton of food and just bring people in, you know, from all walks of life, from all different places. He would hear somebody that felt lonely and say, oh, we'll come to dinner at our house. You know, we're going to have a big table dinner. And people loved it. You know, people that were 
not churchgoers actually responded the most because they said, we've never experienced anything like this, mm. you know, because this is, we, we need this, you know, and they would just do silly things like play games and, you know, and talk and, and eat and share and share jokes, you know, so almost like the Christian small group rewritten to include non-Christians. And I, I think we do need to be on the lookout like Jesus was for the lonely people. I mean, he sought out Zacchaeus, right? Zacchaeus was lonely. He sought out the woman at the well. She was lonely because she was, you know, had not a great past and went to the well alone every day. So I, I think just asking for the heart of Jesus to open our eyes to who in our worlds, in our world, our neighborhood, our churches, our schools, just are lonely and need a friend. Mm. So let me ask you this, because I, I think this kind of goes to the work that you're doing. Um, so like, uh, you're writing a book that is going to come out this summer. That's for like three to four women to get together. And yep. I feel like there's this pressure. It's funny. Like I led a, a group of men this summer, um, my pastor, Daniel McNaughton from Philadelphia, he wrote a book called follow. And like, what I found was when you have like a purpose, like it's easy to go deeper because like the expectations are clear. But then I also know people that are like, well, we should just meet. And I, I think what I struggle with too is like, so even with mentoring, like the best mentoring relationships have a definitive like we're gonna work on this at this time and afterwards we might keep meeting but like there's a formalness of this how do you as someone that's writing books to help people not be lonely and connect spiritually there's some people that are like why don't we just get together and watch monday night football like why don't we just get together you know to watch gray's anatomy if that's still on its 20th season versus like there's purpose and then there's like quote unquote organic connection. Like how do you manage that knowing that there's different types of people or do you agree, disagree with that? I I don't agree or disagree with that. I mean, I, I guess I agree with that. I, I think some people are going to be more surfacey relationships for you, you know, and and they're going to be the Monday night football people. My son-in-law would crucify me for saying that. <laughs> he, he says you can form deep relationships around football anyway. But, um, you know, there are going to, you're going to have relationships in your life where, you know, maybe they're not the deepest relationships. Um, I, I think the, the small group gatherings where you're really going to get into the word and you're really going to ask purposeful questions to draw each other out those yeah you will go deep but you can also throw in the fun activities as well you know like fantasy football or monday night football or whatever or gray's anatomy or whatever so it i don't think it needs to be either or i guess is what i'm trying to say i think you can form relationships in all of that and the key is to keep your heart in the right place. You know, relationships take time. So you got to create space for them. Uh, <clears throat> relationships take vulnerability. So you got to choose to be vulnerable. You know, I think a lot of people, maybe they've gotten hurt in a past relationship. And so there's a wall up and you know, you can only get so far with them because then the wall comes up. Right. So I think, you know, just analyzing like, what do I want out of relationships and, and going from there, you know, and not, and, and maybe it's organic and purposeful both. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me just add a, a little fabric to the, cause I, I loved your response. What if let's say I'm really lonely and I'm like, totally organic like you know i i feel like it's better to get to know people but like i don't want to like set the time to do that but the only opportunity that i have is something that's super structured or the the opposite which is i'm super structured but the only you know kind of opportunity in front of me is organic i i feel like people kind of struggle because it's like uh, i i don't want to sound crass and say it's either you want to solve the problem and you're going to take the opportunity in front of you 
or you're just going to wait for the opportunity. But you're kind of making a choice. Does that make sense? Yeah, I I think some people are looking for perfection, you know, mm. and so they want to run friendships on their own terms. And any relationship is give and take, right? So, you know, it, it's like, okay, it, I will invite people over on nights that I have free that work for Steve. And if people can't come, that's fine, you know, or if, and if somebody texts me spontaneously and says, Hey, let's meet right now. If I can do it, great. If I can't, I can't, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think we have to give each other grace in those spaces. You, you can't be rigid and be a really good friend. I don't think, mm -hmm. um, you know, there has to be a lot of grace in the relationship because we're not perfect and we're never going to be, you know? And I, I, sometimes I joke with some of my friends because I mean, I have deadlines, so I, I do have to meet those deadlines, you know? So sometimes I can't drop everything and go off and do something. Sometimes I can, but you know, sometimes I can't. Mm -hmm. Becky, uh, oh, did you have one? Uh, no, I was just going to say um, in my small group, I'm in a small group with my husband and three other couples, and uh -huh. we've been navigating the organic friendships versus the structure. <laughs> and for us, we found it just depends on the day. Um, all three of them yeah. um, are having kids. One is due in a couple weeks, I'm sure. By the time this comes out, she will have a, a little baby. Um, and then the other two have babies too. So... Um, it's very up in the air depending on how everyone's doing, depending on what's going on in life. Um, we have started things and stopped them because of just life happens. Um, and then we yeah. also been in rhythms where we just hang out and then we're like, you know, this isn't very purposeful. Maybe we should um, have more structure and then mm. we create that. So it's just, it's gone through waves. And I think that's how a healthy relationship should be. It should um, have a mix of maybe, or structure and um organicness to it and it should be okay if you have to change and i think um that that's a sign yes. of a healthy relationship to be able to adjust to real life because life happens and we need to react yeah. to that appropriately i agree with you yeah i mean do you have any other thoughts based on what Alyssa said or you know is that maybe the better well, way to I, I, oh, go ahead i think I think that that is great what Melissa said, because I think that that's such a good example. So I think about, you know, the small group again that my kids are in and, you know, there's like 25 kids <laughs> like they, So there's these couples, but there's like 20 kids, you know, so they have a babysitter and every now and then, you know, they have to flex and it's like, okay, the girls in the group are just going to have dessert or the guys are going to go out or whatever. And sometimes it's like, okay, let's just do a volleyball night, you know, but there's the depth of the relationship because they've been in the group for a while, you know? And, and so I think like, it's kind of like a marriage. I mean, if I sat down with Steve every day and said, okay, we have to be very purposeful in this moment. I mean, he would roll his eyes and I can just hear him right now. I mean, sometimes <laughs> we have purposeful conversations. Sometimes it's just like, hey, what deadlines do you have? These are what deadlines I have. Or let's watch a movie tonight or let's go out to dinner. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's okay to have both is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. No, I think that that's super helpful. And uh, no, I'm glad you allowed that, Alyssa. You know, maybe before we get to our last question, you know, why don't you just kind of give advice to each kind of decade or stage, however you want to choose. So maybe single, maybe married without kids, maybe married with kids, maybe approaching emptiness because, you know, you've you've lived in those stages, you know, people in those stages. You know, if you could give one piece of advice to each stage about loneliness, you know, why don't you go for it? Okay. That's a good question. I've never been asked that one before, Pete. Well done. Um, <laughs> so I think if you're single, be careful to enjoy the season you're in and not keep thinking, okay, I'm not going to be lonely when I get married because bring your most healthy self to the marriage, you know? And so if, if you work out loneliness now, you'll be a better spouse then. And then if you're 
early married, enjoy the season you're in, you know, because if you don't have kids yet, you never get those years back. Once you have kids, kids are there forever. Right. So, I mean, you can go through empty nests, but you still have kids. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think enjoy the time you have together before you have kids. If you have kids, the temptation is to think, oh, I can't wait till this kid is old enough to tie their shoes. I can't wait till this kid is old enough to be in school all day. I can't wait till this kid is old enough to drive themselves or whatever. Enjoy the stage you're in. I, I kind of think that goes with everything. And then if you're empty nesters, enjoy that stage. I mean, it's really fun for Steve and I. Yes, we both travel, but when we're both home, we'll go out for a hike at night together or we'll watch a movie together. Now, let me say, the kids don't just go away, right? Four kids <laughs> becomes eight kids, becomes an additional 14 grandkids. So, you know, our prayer lists are getting longer and longer and longer. But enjoy each season and don't rush forward to the next one, you know? No, that's really good. Um, I don't know. Maybe you got to add that chapter, you know, to your book about loneliness and stages. Not that I want to give you more work to do, you know? <laughs> So the loneliness book, the book that's actually letting go of loneliness, it is goes through the one another statements in scripture. It's not a Bible study. It could be studied like that, I suppose. But it's a chapter book because there are so many statements in the New Testament where one another is used. And Jesus is trying to send us a very clear message. You're not supposed to do this alone. So it's comfort one another. It's encourage one another. It's don't envy one another, you know, um, don't judge one another. And so I, each chapter goes through those one another statements. And if we really lived those statements, I we wouldn't be lonely. Hmm. Wow. Good. L look at you. Look at you be a pastor right mm -hmm. there. And we didn't even get to our fun <laughs> closing question. That's mm -hmm. what we need. So uh, as as we've done before in our last episode and, um, you know, for some reason, I, I'm like, oh, our last episode that we did with you was why won't my parents listen to me and loneliness? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how those go together. But anyways, our last question here is uh, what does Jesus have to say about this topic? So the cool thing is Alyssa and I you know, we're going to respond to it, but you can clean up any mess. Does that sound good? Okay. Sounds great. Go. <laughs> so Alyssa, you get to go first. I'll go first. Uh, there we go. Um, first of all, I cannot wait to read your book. That sounds like it's going to be oh, really good. You. So 2024, I'll give you a call and get a copy. Okay. <laughs> great. Um, and next, what would Jesus have to say about loneliness? Um, I think we have to take it all the way back to the beginning um, and look at, the Trinity. I mean, God exists in community, right? And there's the Father, mm -hmm. the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I think that's just the ultimate example of how he designed us to live. Um, and we even see that when he creates us and he creates Adam and Adam's alone. And God says, that's not good. Um, yeah. Let me create a helper for him. Let me create a woman. And so um, we see that from the very beginning of humanity is that we are created to be in relationship with others. Um, and yes. even then, um, when Jesus was alive and well, Jesus is alive, I always say that when Jesus was walking the earth, um, he had his disciples, he had his 12 people around him and he was constantly engaging with others and um, constantly seeking out connections with um, those who may be lonely. So I just think we have the, the perfect example of why we need community and why we feel so lonely without it. It's because we were literally created for community. And without that, there's going to be something missing because that's how God designed us to be. Um, mm. So that's what I would have to say about that. Man, that's really good. Uh, Lisa. So you know, I kept thinking about because one of the things, Becky, I appreciate about you is you're you're graciously forward. Like you're this rare, like, you know, like you'd say something like, you know, I know you're lonely, but you need to invite that friend to coffee. Like you can give mm -hmm. a hard message. And I think that that's a lot what Jesus did. I'm thinking about in Philippians, um, Paul was writing to that church and there's a verse in there that says defer to one another you know, out of mm. love. And I think people misunderstand yes. that of thinking that that verse has to do, 
with being a doormat. But the assumption mm -hmm. of that verse is if people are loving God and loving others, you're creating a community that's actually taking care of each other in healthy ways. And I think that that's kind of what our loneliness epidemic is, is that when you love yourself, love others, and love God, you begin to see the needs that are in front of other people. And I think what I'm kind of taking away from this conversation is the one another's in the Bible, the kind of knowing that Jesus and prayer are kind of some of the remedies to loneliness, it moves you to, towards others and moves you away from yourself in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. And I'll just kind of give a quick example, but when when I'm not meeting with people, even for my job, and you know, it's hard to kind of say it for a job because like I just love it so much. When I'm mm -hmm. not meeting with people, I'm on social media more. And so what I'm kind of seeing is, is when, when I'm making space for people the way Jesus did, you know, my social media use is at a healthy place as opposed to an unhealthy place. And I think for all of us to begin saying, how are we creating relationships through Jesus that are deferring to one another? I think that that's mm. kind of the powerfulness of talking about loneliness with you. So go ahead, clean up whatever mess we left you. I, I, you both raised such good points. And so, um, you know, the first girlfriend gathering actually is based on the book of Philippians. So I love that you brought that out, Pete. Um, but I, I think what would Jesus say about loneliness? Jesus said, um, in the vineyard, remember, he said, stay connected to me, stay mm. connected over and over. He said that in the vineyard. And then he said, I, you are my friends. And I love that because he, he, he didn't say, I'm just a savior to you. Yes, he is a savior to us, but he also wants friendship with us. And he said, he went on to say, love one another like I've loved you. You know, like you've had these three years with me and I've loved you and I've modeled what relationship with you is like. You know, we've walked together, we've talked together, we've gone to parties together, we've prayed together, we've washed, you know, I've washed your feet, we've shared the Lord's Supper together. So love one another like I've loved you, you know, be a friend to other people and, and, and realize that in doing so, you're setting an example to the world. Wouldn't it be great if the world looked on the church and said, mm. wow, I want to be a part of that because those people are so loving and so well connected. Mm. Wow. What a way to close. Um, Becky, you are all over the place. So we want people to follow you. So probably the best place for them to start is beckyharling.com, right? Yes. Yes. And I think I have a free gift up right now. I do. Uh, I think it's called prayers to calm your anxious heart. So that's a free ebook they can download. Then there's also the five day listening challenges up there too, to see how well you listen to other people. <laughs> Don't share that with my wife. No, I'm getting better listener. <laughs> but uh, anyways, you can find her at beckyharling.com. And if you know a mom in your life, make sure you uh, tell them to subscribe to our sister podcast, uh, part of the Luma Vaz Network, the Connected Mom Podcast. And uh, yeah. You can f yeah, make sure you sign up there. But yeah, go to the whygodwhypodcast.com. Make sure you click subscribe. We're so glad that you joined us. And we know that this was definitely a question that you might not feel comfortable asking in church. Have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.